Okay, welcome back. Hope you had a good break. Uh, we'll, we'll continue from uh, from where we stopped. So, yeah. So verse uh, verse twenty two. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. So um, Paul uh, here reflects that, uh, the thing of uh, they're shaming those who have nothing, right? They're, they're shaming the poor, uh, and they're despising the fact that uh, that they are one in Christ. So they're despising the church of God and shaming those who have nothing. Uh, by coming together and eating in this way, uh, and he's saying, you're acting like you do not have your own houses where you can eat and drink because you're coming here and eating as if uh, you've not eaten at all or you've not drunk at all. Um, verse 23, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Uh, so here he starts to talk about what is uh, the Lord's table supposed to look like. Uh, and this is something that Jesus himself passed on uh, to the apostles. And so he says, I received it from the Lord, although Paul was not at that first um, at the Last Supper, right, where where this was instituted. Uh, as an apostle, this is a teaching that he received. And uh, so uh, this is the teaching that he's passing on to the church. And so this is how we understand when he's talking in verse 1, uh, in verse 2, he talks about passing on the traditions to the church. Uh, this is what is a tradition, where it's something that they had received from the Lord, uh, and they were passing on to the church uh, to be continued as something that the church will practice. Mm. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, so referring here to the Last Supper uh, and, uh, and what we have recorded in the Gospels of the Last Supper. Verse 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Um, so he had uh, he had blessed the bread, right? He had given thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples. Uh, and this was what he was saying. This bread is my body, which I'm giving to you. And so when you're taking part in the Lord's Supper, you're doing it in remembrance of me. That is, you're remembering my body that was broken for you. Uh, and in the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So when we are participating uh, in the, when we are taking part in the communion, we are participating in this, like he talked about in the previous chapter, in chapter 10. You cannot participate in the Lord's table and also be part of uh, this uh, demonic worship of food offered to idols, right? So in the same way here, we are participating in uh, what Christ has done on the cross. So we are uh, receiving for ourselves that new covenant in Christ's blood. Uh, and we again do it remembering what Christ has done for us. Um, verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So not only is it a remembrance of what Christ did for us on the cross, but is also a proclamation uh, of what he did. So we are saying we believe uh, that Jesus gave his life for us. We believe that our sins are taken away uh, because of the cross. We believe that healing is us uh, because uh, all our sickness was taken uh, on the cross. By his stripes, we were healed. Uh, we believe that we are no longer under the dominion of sin because the power of sin was broken. Uh, we believe that all our punishment has been taken away. And so we can experience complete well-being. We can experience shalom uh, here and now and look forward to that uh, full shalom 
in Christ's presence uh, when he comes again. Um, so all of these declarations, we believe that the curse of the law has been removed, right? So uh, every curse uh, that was proclaimed upon those who did not follow the law, uh, every curse that was proclaimed even over Adam and Eve because of their sin, all those things have been broken. Uh, and we instead enjoy the blessings of Abraham. Um, we believe that Satan's power has been destroyed, and so we have authority over Satan and his demons. Uh, these are the things we proclaim when we are participating in the Lord's table, and it's a proclamation of Christ's victory on the cross, and it is a participation in that victory, like we looked at in chapter 10. Uh, verse 27, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. So verse 27 and 28 is saying, uh, if you do not examine yourself, if you do not uh, check your own heart, check your own conscience, uh, and come to the Lord's Supper in this manner of uh, gratitude towards God, of recognizing the power of what you're doing, recognizing uh, the power of Christ, uh, then you are sinning against uh, God. You are dishonoring uh, that body and blood that was given, was sacrificed for you. You are dishonoring it, and you are um, you are guilty of sinning against Christ's body and blood. Uh, verse 29, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment on himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Uh, so he's saying, uh, not only will you be guilty, but you will also be judged for participating in this manner because you are not uh, you are not acknowledging the power of what you're doing, and you're not uh, discerning the Lord's body. That is, you're not uh, recognizing that you, as the body of Christ, are coming together uh, and participating in this to declare that you are united in Christ. Right? We all take part in this one bread, and therefore we are one. Uh, so there must be unity. But if you are engaging in this uh, in a way that is divided, where you are one is uh, only thinking about themselves, then you are completely losing the point of what we are doing here. Uh, and so you will be under judgment for uh, for doing it in this unworthy way, for, um, for defiling and dishonoring uh, what the Lord's Supper means. Uh, verse 30, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Um, so he is giving examples of how judgment has come upon them. So some of them are weak, some of them are sick, some of them have died. Um, but it is because they have not examined themselves when they are coming to uh, take part in the Lord's Supper. And so he says, uh, if you were examining yourself, if you were judging your own self, then you wouldn't come under God's judgment. Uh, then verse 32 says, but even when God is judging, it is so that you will be uh, corrected and brought back to Christ, and you will not receive the condemnation that belongs to the world, to those outside of the church, uh, outside of the believing uh, believing body of Christ. Uh, verse 33, therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. So uh, his instruction is uh, think about the other, right? So this is something that he's already said before in Corinthians, right? Think about uh, others before you think about yourself. Uh, so this is the same thing that he's saying. When you're coming together, you all wait for one another. That is, let everyone else eat. Don't only be concerned about yourself. Uh, but if you are really hungry, then you come prepared. Eat before you come so that you won't bring judgment 
on yourself. Uh, and then he says when he visits them, he will um, he will set other things in order. So um, let's see if we've covered everything. Okay, so a little more on the uh, judgment uh, that. Uh, that came upon them. And this is something that also a lot of Christians fear uh, taking part in communion, wondering whether they will be judged because uh, there is some sin in their life. Uh, but that is not something for us to be afraid of uh, because we already have this warning, right? We, uh, what Paul says, that we are to examine ourselves and we are to judge ourselves. And if uh, if we do this and we feel that uh, that our conscience is clear, we can take part in uh, the Lord's table without any guilt. And uh, it is the Spirit who testifies to us, who uh, will convict us of our sin, right? So if there is no such conviction, we don't have to be afraid of uh, receiving the Lord's communion. We trust that uh, Christ has already forgiven us and we've come with that acknowledgement uh, that we are dependent on what Christ has done in the, on the cross. And so we're receiving that communion. We're receiving um, what's offered to us, the bread and the juice, the bread and the wine, uh, recognizing our dependence on Christ. So if we are coming with that posture, then we have no reason to fear. Uh, but here it was because there was no self-examination, uh, there was no looking at themselves, and they were taking part in it in a very, very uh, disrespectful way. Imagine Christ on the cross. Christ has uh, sacrificed himself for the believer's salvation, uh, for the individual salvation, and for the church. Uh, and they are coming there and getting drunk. They are, uh, they are only concerned about themselves, about feeding themselves. There's division based on class and uh, status. Uh, that is a dishonoring of what Christ has done. right? And so this was because of their attitude towards Lord's Supper that there was, they were receiving that judgment. But that judgment was also to uh, come back to Christ come back and recognize uh, that they had sinned against God. So uh, when, when uh, they were doing this, it was they were receiving um, or they were stepping out of God's protection on their lives. So instead of saying or instead of declaring all the things that were theirs in Christ through the cross and then participating in the Lord's Supper, because they were not acknowledging Christ's sacrifice, they were actually stepping out of all that Christ has offered through the cross. And so that's why sickness and weakness and premature death was being experienced by the congregation. Um, so God allowed these things to happen to them so that they would come back to him. Uh, so it's not that uh, God was just wanting to bring judgment uh, to punish them, but it was to bring them back, to restore them, to save them. Okay, so uh, any questions on this section before we move into chapter 12? Okay, we can move into chapter 12. Um, so the first part uh, of Paul's discussion in this previous chapter was with head coverings, with the Lord's Supper. So he's talking specifically about as when we gather as a church, how are we supposed to operate? How do we uh, function? Because these were young believers who were gathering. So he was trying to uh, 
organized, to correct, to uh, just ensure that when they were gathering, there was truly a spirit of worship among them and uh, that they were able to honor God through their times of gathering together. So he continues in that uh, in that um, kind of the things that he wants to address. And in chapter 12, he continues to talk about how do we gather in the church and how do we exercise spiritual gifts when we gather as a church? Uh, so verses 1 to 11, uh, can somebody read that for us, please? Verse 1, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. After that, miracles. Then, gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues are all apostles are all prophets are all teachers are all workers of miracles do all have gifts of healings do all speak with tongues do all interpret but earnestly desire the best gifts and yet i show you a more excellent way amen okay. so um
So here we see uh, Paul starting to talk first about the spiritual gifts. Uh, so verse 1, uh, he says, uh, I do not want you to be ignorant about it. Uh, so we see uh, earlier uh, that Paul talks a lot about the Corinthians uh, having all of these spiritual gifts, right? Uh, uh, we that they were practicing these gifts, that uh, they were actually uh, kind of seeing all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit being expressed within the church. So in that way, um, they were really uh, seeing God's glory manifested through these gifts amongst them. Uh, but the problem was with their level of maturity. And so uh, even in this teaching, he's trying to help them understand, OK, you're seeing all of these gifts. And that's uh, that's a wonderful thing to see uh, and to be experiencing, to be uh, flowing in the gifts of the spirit. But how do we uh, use it in a way that promotes order within the church services so that everybody isn't uh, coming and trying to speak? Everyone is trying to uh, trying to bring their gifts in a way that actually causes disruption to what is happening. Um, and when he's talking about spiritual gifts, uh, so that word uh, is pneumaticos, which means uh, non-carnal, uh, or means what we've seen in scripture, spiritual or supernatural. So this doesn't refer to things that we uh, acquire naturally, like skills that we can get. Uh, so some people uh, are good at certain things because they've learned it or uh, they've practiced it, whether it be uh, preaching or singing or teaching. All of those things are things that can be improved upon, that can be uh, learned. Uh, but there are there's also a spiritual aspect of being gifted uh, in a supernatural way that is beyond someone's natural ability. And so this is what Paul is talking about here. So gifts that are empowered by the Holy Spirit, uh, that the Holy Spirit gives to the church for the edification of the body uh, as the church gathers uh, together. So verse 2. Um, so in their past, they had been idol worshippers. So he refers to these idols as dumb idols, that is, idols who didn't speak. Uh, contrast God, uh, contrast the Holy Spirit with these idols. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Uh, he reveals himself to us, and then he reveals himself through us through the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, so unlike the idols they were worshipping, uh, that could not speak to them, that could not uh, in any way uh, reach out to them or uh, in any way uh, communicate to them. The Holy Spirit was communicating to them and does communicate to us uh, and also uses us to communicate to others things about who God is. So to reveal God through us to other people. Um, verse so just uh, something uh, to share about verse 2 as well. I have heard testimonies of so many people who come uh, from different faith backgrounds where one of the things that majorly impacted them uh, and really, uh, really was a turning point for them in their faith was recognizing that their gods couldn't speak to them. Uh, that there was no relationship they could have with their God. So they would go, uh, they would pray to, uh, they would pray before idols or they would pray to their gods, but they never received answers. Uh, and they always wondered, like, what am I doing? Why am I coming here? But there's nothing that I'm receiving or there's nothing that I'm hearing. There's nothing that, there are no answers that I'm getting back. So to recognize uh, the God uh, of scripture, who is one who wants to be in relationship with us, who is one who wants to uh, speak to us, wants to hear us speak to him, and wants to be in that kind of uh, relationship where we are engaging with one another is a powerful and amazing gift that we have as believers. Um, 
So this uh, this is something that he uh, Paul points to, points out to the churches uh, that the spirit of God is revealing Himself to you and through you uh, by using these gifts. And so the gifts are there for God to express Himself through us, through believers. Uh, verse three. Uh, so no one speaking by the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God will always glorify Jesus. So it cannot curse Jesus. Uh, and if someone is actually saying Jesus is Lord or acknowledging Jesus as Lord, uh, we must recognize that it is the work of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus is being glorified, when he is uh, being uh, acknowledged, for who he is, then that is a work of the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, if Jesus is being dishonored, uh, then uh, it cannot be something that is coming from the Spirit of God. Verse 4, there are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. So uh, here the word gifts is the word charisma, meaning a gift of grace. Uh, where charis means grace. So charisma is the gift of grace that comes from the Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, these gifts are not earned. So it's not something that we get because we've reached a certain uh, status in our spiritual walk with God, not because we've uh, become more mature or we've achieved something. It's always something that is given to us purely out of the grace of God. Uh, verse 5, there are different ministries, but the same Lord. So ministries here is the Greek word uh, diakonia, which means service or office. So it is a position uh, or a role that you play within the church. So a pastor, a teacher, an apostle, a prophet, a deacon, an intercessor. So it's something that you are doing. It's a, a role that you are playing within the church. So you're saying you may have a certain role in the church, but you all are under the same Lord. So it doesn't matter what your role is, whether it's uh, one role is given more importance by some people or another role is given more importance by other people. That doesn't matter. You are all under the Lordship of Christ. And then verse 6, there are a diversity of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. And uh, activities, the Greek word is energema, meaning workings or outward manifestations. So uh, where God manifests or reveals himself through the things that we are doing. Uh, so this, uh, these three verses, four to six, can be understood as the spirit who is empowering all of these things. Uh, so uh, verse four, where the spirit is giving us these, uh, the charisma, the spiritual gifts, or uh, the spirit is also giving us these different ministries that we are doing within the church, and the Spirit is empowering us to do these activities um, or reveal the glory of God through the things that we are doing. Uh, on the other hand, we can also understand it uh, the way the text uh, mentions three different things. It mentions the same Spirit in verse 4. So the gifts come from the same Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit distributes these gifts to the church. Uh, verse 5. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. So to understand that Jesus is head over the church. And so all the roles within the church, or all these offices that are given, are under the Lordship of Christ. And verse 6, that all of these manifestations that come through, uh, through the believer are things that reveal uh, God. So God, the Father, is working through us to reveal, to manifest his glory through us. Uh, so it can be understood as the Father, uh, as the Holy Spirit, Jesus and the Father, or it can be understood as the Holy Spirit empowering all things. Um, but both of them would mean the same thing, that God himself is the one giving the gifts, giving the ministry positions, uh, giving or empowering us to do the works that he has called us to. Okay, so 
uh, there's a little explanation here. Have you all uh, done the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the co in your courses in first year or second year? The gifts of the Holy Spirit book, right? You'll have that as first a text. I think in first year, Holy Spirit was a subject. Okay, so the first in first year. So uh, a lot of this content is from that book. Uh, so maybe it may not be completely new, but it will also be, I think, just a refresher of uh, what we already covered. So uh, an example, just to explain what it means to have the gifts. Uh, the ministries and the operations that it talks about in four uh, verses four to six. Uh, so the example here is of different uh, occupations, right? Someone is an electrician, someone's a plumber, someone's a carpenter, someone's a mechanic. Uh, so they have all of these different roles, but they all use very similar tools. They may be using the same tools sometimes. So uh, to look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit as a toolbox, which is full of these different tools that we use. And depending on your role, if you are, a, so in this case, if an electrician is using something, uh, if he's using a, a screwdriver, he may use it in a different way than a carpenter uses a screwdriver. So in the same way, someone who is in a different uh, ministerial role in the church may be using the same spiritual gift, but how they use it and the effect of what they do uh, will look different uh, than someone who may be in a different uh, ministerial role. So say a preacher versus a teacher, um, a preacher uh, may use the gift of uh, knowledge to say something to the whole congregation. Uh, whereas a teacher may not have that same opportunity to speak over a whole congregation, uh, but to speak to the group of people that they are entrusted to them, who they are teaching, uh, to be able to reveal a word of knowledge uh, from the passage that they are teaching or from whatever it is that they are teaching from scripture, uh, to reveal a um, word of knowledge to the class, or to the people they are teaching. So. It's the same gift of the word of knowledge, but how it's expressed will change based on the ministerial role that the person is in. Um, is that clear? Right. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, so we'll uh, move on to verse seven. The manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So this is important for us to understand that uh, whatever the gifts are that the spirit is giving to us. So that's what he spoke about in verse four. Uh, these gifts of grace is given for the benefit of the church uh, is given to build up the other believers around us. It's not for our own benefit, not to. Uh, prove our spirituality, not to elevate ourselves, uh, but it is given to benefit others, to bless others. Uh, verse 8 to 10. Um, so one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit, another a word of knowledge through the same Spirit, another faith, another gifts of healing, workings of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. So we have uh, the nine uh, spiritual gifts that are mentioned here. And saying even if there are these nine different gifts, uh, they all come from the same spirit. And each one may have a different spiritual gift being given to them. Uh, this doesn't mean that each one will only have that one spiritual gift. They may have multiple gifts, and they could have all the gifts. But in a specific meeting, uh, they might have a word of wisdom that they share. Uh, and someone else might have a word of knowledge. Uh, that does not mean that they will always have a word of wisdom, and they will only have a word of wisdom every time the church gathers. The next time they meet, God might give them a gift of healing to be able to uh, heal somebody. So it is possible for believers to exercise more than one gift, to exercise all the nine gifts if we are, uh, if we are pursuing that and desiring it, like uh, 
uh, Paul will continue to talk about. Uh, but in a specific gathering, different people, so everyone can come and contribute to the gathering by bringing their spiritual gifts. That is the point, uh, that each person will bring the gift that God uh, is giving them in that setting, and they can bring it to bless the rest of the church. Okay. So verse 11, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So uh, the important thing is that the Holy Spirit wills this. Uh, it is not uh, it is not something that God desires to withhold from us. Rather, it's something that God wants to give to us because uh, as he gives it to us, the church is built up. Uh, and uh, the glory of God is manifested in our gatherings uh, when these gifts are being uh, being exercised and being exercised in a way that is as per God's uh, God's desire. Uh, but it's not only God's will; God doesn't force those gifts on us. It's also how we respond. So if we uh, allow God to operate, so if we uh, surrender ourselves if we are willing, if we cooperate, and um, and we have that desire to have these gifts and have the faith that God will use us and God desires to use us, uh, then we can exercise the gifts. But if we do not have the faith or we do not have the desire or we're not willing to cooperate with God's leading, then uh, God will not force that on us. They will not. Uh, release a gift without our own willingness to receive it. Now, there are times when um, people have started to speak in tongues just when they uh, became believers. That is a different context. That's not that uh, God forced uh, his gift of tongues on them. It was God poured out his Holy Spirit because they were at a point of reception of uh, faith in God, God poured it out. Uh, this is in the context specifically of the local gathering, where when we gather as a church, if we are willing to uh, exercise these gifts, if we are saying, God, you can use me uh, to bless the church, then God will, uh, God will give us the gifts that's necessary at that time. Okay, so we'll move on to verse 12. Um, any questions so far or anything you'll want to share? So um, one thing is for us to consider, like, how much do we see this in our gatherings? Are we seeing enough of it? Um, are we, how are we positioning ourselves when we go to church gatherings? And also, how are we leading our, um, wherever God has put us in whatever kind of leadership role or role of influence, uh, that we are encouraging other believers to come in and uh, be able to build up one another using the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, that's just something for us to think about. Anything you'll want to share regarding that? Do you all um, feel that you see enough of it? And if not, um, what do you think are some steps that can be taken? Yeah, so right now I'm part of APC, so I think I'm seeing too much of it here <laughs> in the gathering. Uh, but then back in my place, maybe uh, 
I think uh, I haven't seen these things. I I never even thought I'll learn about the gifts of the spirit, or I'll be the one who uh, has this gift of knowledge after coming here. Uh, everything was a new experience to me, and and it's actually a deeper learning to me. So one thing that I feel that uh, makes uh, what makes us to grow in the gifts of a spirit here is the teaching that we get uh, someone is there to guide us and teach us i think uh, in the supernatural hour in the in the semester uh, in the past semester uh, our faculties and pastors they encourage us to grow in the gifts of the spirit and i thought that happens only in the bible college but when i go back to the church i see that happening that even in the church they have supernatural sunday they have supernatural uh, healing divine healing sundays uh, where they and pastor ashish actually writes books that helps them to learn on how to prophesy how to uh, grow in the gifts of the spirit and i think this teaching is what made people uh, believe uh, and to grow in that i think that's what made me believe really uh, when they give me the scriptural references of yeah you can prophesy you can have the word of knowledge you can speak in tongues those things uh, stirred stirred up my spirit to believe that and uh, they ha- i think the teachings are enough proof of it like yeah, it is true back in my place maybe we don't have the proof of those things and we don't see it happening at church so i think the teaching is the most important thing that that helps people to understand that there is something like this it's not only for someone who has this gift or someone who's special uh, who's called as a prophet they can prophesy that that's what i believed all my life i thought no one else can do it some people are specially called for it and we also understand the offices that are kind of little more different and as believers we can exercise these things so i believe the teachings are the more important i think every church should have this wholesome teaching because sometimes we are just done with teaching that god is lovable god is good god is kind <laughs> god is there for you <laughs> but then there are some things that are beyond uh, the authority that Christ has given us the gifts that he has given us uh, it changes our lifestyle our perspectives and i think every church should teach it should uh, for everyone for everyone they should receive this teaching and once they receive the teaching i think they will be able to do it yeah i think uh, that's what paul is doing here right regarding the spiritual gifts i don't want you to be ignorant so uh, the difference here is the corinthian church was already uh, flowing in the gifts of the spirit but he wanted to help them understand what its purpose was uh, and how it should be used in a way that is orderly um, on the other hand where we're not seeing uh spiritual gifts being used or being expressed uh one important way is to start with scripture to uh to teach to help people see uh, that this is something that god has given to the church and no when scripture does it say this was taken away from the church or it was no longer to be practiced uh so we believe that is something that we can continue to experience uh even today and why is it important uh, why are why is it important to express these gifts or to have these gifts in our services any thoughts on that um i think the gifts is strengthens us and encourages us when we have it in the congregation uh that's that's one of the thing i feel when i remember the first time people came and prophesied over me and they said uh, the right words that i needed the encouragement that i needed i think that builds the fellowship of the church it's not just that we come and we attend a service and then we just go uh, but these when we have the gifts and when we have this uh, passion and desire to share the gifts even i had moments in church 
where i'm revealed something in my spirit and i won't even know the person i i won't even know who she is what she is doing i just want to go and pray over her i just want to tell her something so i think that actually builds the church stronger builds the fellowship of the believers uh, we just have this desire because we have got the gift we have this our love for others grows we just want to share our gifts bless them with it i think that's one of the major thing because that's what happened to me when a, when a person came to me and said something i was like i don't know you you don't know me why why you even want to do it but i think that that love also comes after us as we exercise the gifts when we come when we were revealed something in the spirit about others uh, we go out of love not because we have got the gift we are not going out of pride but we go out of love we just want to share it with them encourage them strengthen them one of the major thing i believe is it strengthens us strengthens the fellowship of the church helps us to uh, get closer with each other thank you anyone uh, else want to share okay so yeah so there is a reason why these gifts are to be exercised right so uh, paul is talking about it benefiting uh, benefiting the church when we express these gifts but in what ways does it benefit the church uh, it it enables uh, people to hear directly from god right so um, people are able to speak into each other's lives uh things that uh, so if we are using a word of knowledge then it's not something that that person could have naturally known uh, but they are speaking into your life uh something that god has revealed to them and so all of these things must be tested at the same time so we cannot just receive anything that someone is saying uh and say this is from god uh we will go back to god we will test it uh with scripture we will uh ask god himself to speak to us the holy spirit to reveal to us uh, the truth of what is being said uh, so it must be uh, brought before god brought before scripture and tested before we receive word but uh to receive that kind of word um in the right season so in something that you are going through to hear from god uh, and to know that god is there present god is uh, concerned about what you're going through and he wants to reveal uh, himself in that situation he wants to remind you of who he is he wants to um, he wants to uh, remind you that he is present with you that he is working uh, in the midst of whatever you're going through or uh, to experience healing to experience deliverance uh, all of these things are god directly intervening in the lives of believers uh, in the hardships that they are facing uh, to bring uh, restoration to uh, to what he originally wanted for us to what he desires for us to experience that wholeness that shalom uh, that fullness of life in christ uh, and so uh, when we are gathering when we are exercising these gifts it is to uh, to fully receive that through through these gifts to receive uh, restoration to receive healing to uh, be brought closer to god to uh, grow in our faith to grow in our understanding of who god is uh, and that's why it's so important for these gifts to be exercised and also for it to be uh, the whole church that is doing this right it's not just the pastor who is ministering uh, from the pulpit but it is uh, the members of the church are ministering to one another uh, so that also is a powerful thing when we're gathering as a church that each one of us is bringing something is uh, coming with the desire to bless the body of christ uh, we're not coming there simply as passive uh, passive receivers we're just not going to come there and sit and uh, listen and take in and soak it all up and then leave the church now we're coming there to minister to one another to be used to bless 
the others in the gathering. Uh, so uh, just to have that perspective that the church is a gathering of, um, of the, uh, the priesthood of Christ, right? So everyone uh, there is a priest, everyone is a minister and has the opportunity to be able to uh, to build the church, to be able to minister to one another. Uh, so the Corinthian church was doing this well, uh, but uh, there are certain things that they were not doing well as well, which is why Paul talks about, he'll continue to talk about how do we exercise these gifts in a way that is orderly, uh, that does not cause disruption, uh, all of those things. So we will look at that. Um, next week. Also, I was supposed to uh, give you all a quiz. Uh, actually, next week is a holiday, October 2nd, right? Uh, so we won't meet October 2nd, we'll meet the following week. Uh, but um, I will post on Google Classroom a quiz. So just be on the lookout for that. I'll try and post it this week and then maybe give you all a, a week to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.